practice that we're doing is called the karma that puts an end to karma. And because karma is intention, it means it's the intention to put an end to intention. That's why it's tricky. Because if you intend to put a stop to intention, well, that's an intention right there. But that doesn't mean it's impossible. It simply means there are going to be some unexpected twists and turns along the path. As the Buddha said, the central part of his path is right concentration. And concentration basically means a firm intention, sticking with one object. You focus your your intentions on this, how to stay, say, with the breath, how to stay with goodwill, whatever the object of your meditation is. And then try to maintain that intention and see what you learn about intention in the course of trying to maintain it. And see what other things you learn about the mind as you try to maintain that intention. The usual culprits to begin with are distractions, either internal distractions or outside ones. The internal ones are just other thoughts that come up, other intentions. In the beginning, you hardly realize that they're intentions. You're focusing on the breath, everything seems fine, and then suddenly you're someplace else, half a world away. As if someone had come and put a sack over your head and dragged you off and then deposited you someplace else. You don't know what happened in the meantime. You don't catch the fact that there was an intention. There was one brief moment when you decided, I'm out of here. Something else popped up in the mind and you went for it. There was a choice. This is why we have to develop so much mindfulness and alertness. As we practice, mindfulness is the ability to keep that intention in mind, your original intention. And alertness is the ability to keep watch over things. One is focus on what's going with the object of your concentration, and the other is to see how the mind is relating to it. Learn how to catch those warning signals that the mind is about to go. And it takes a while for you to catch them because they're quick and subtle. But the only way you're going to see them is if you try to stick with your original intention and keep yourself warned. Okay, the mind is going to leave. Watch for how it does it. And then also work on ways to make the, the original intention a good one to stay with. Otherwise the mind's going to resist. It's going to be like trying to keep a balloon underwater. It'll stay underwater only as long as your grip is really secure, as soon as there's the slightest Bit of slip, there it goes, popping up out of the water. So this is where you have to get your defilements on your side. They want comfort. Okay, give them comfort. Try to make the breath as comfortable as possible. And breath here is not just the air coming in and out of the lungs. It's your whole sense of energy flow in the body. As the image for the first jhana says, it's like taking moisture in a ball of bath powder. Or you could think of making bread. You put moisture and we put water in with a flour, and you knead it through the flour until every part of that ball of flour is moistened. So you take whatever ease and sense of refreshment that comes from the breath and try to knead it through the body all the way out to the tips of the toes, all the way out to the tips of the fingers, all over front and back. And that, that makes it a good place to stay. Or you can think of systematically going through the body. Relax the 
fingers, relax the palms of your hands, relax your wrists, relax your arms. Any, or anywhere where you can see there's tension that pulls you out of a nice, comfortable, straight up and down posture. Just go up your arms, start with your toes, go up your feet, your legs, the pelvis up the back to the neck, and all the muscles around the head. And then try to develop that all-around awareness that can keep them all relaxed all the time. Makes the body a much nicer place to stay. And as you work on this, it engages several parts of the mind. The desire for pleasure and the desire to explore. As you begin to see connections throughout the body. This means you've got allies inside. As John Lee says, he's like taking Mara and putting him on your side here. So that's one strategy. Another strategy is you have to learn to be very quick with your distractions. It's so easy to get entangled in the, the storyline of wherever your thoughts lead you. If it's inner distractions, a little thought bubble comes up in the mind. You say, let's explore this and see where it goes. And you can find yourself in the Andromeda galaxy. I mean, it can take you far, far away. And sometimes it's hard to pull yourself out because you want to see how the story ends. Almost as if you're committed to it. You see this very easily. You walk past the TV and all of a sudden you find yourself in some stupid story. You know the stu stories on TV are stupid, but you still get sucked in. That's because you allow yourself to get sucked into these stupid stories in your mind. So you have to learn to develop a certain amount of skepticism about these stories. Do you really need to know the end? And learn how to cut things off in the middle of the story. In other cases, the storylines have nothing to do with, or don't start out with internal distractions. They start out with external irritants that pull you away. Someone else says something or does something that irritates you, and all of a sudden you're focused on how much you don't like what they did, said or they did. And you get upset because it's destroyed your concentration. And then again, you can build up a huge narrative about how that person shouldn't have done that, and that the other person destroyed your concentration. It wasn't the other person who destroyed your concentration. You dropped it, ran after them and then found some satisfaction in blaming them. So again, you've got to learn how to pull yourself back out of that mindset as well. No matter what anybody else says or does, your breath is still there. You made the choice to leave. That's what you've got to watch out for. So the whole purpose of this Concentration practice is to get to know this process of intention. The best way to do that is to stick with this one intention as much as you can, because it gives you something to measure your other intentions or to notice how they move. And at the same time, after the distractions get less and less compelling, you begin to look into this intention that you're trying to maintain. What is it made out of? mostly verbal fabrication and mental fabrication. The verbal fabrication is directed thought and evaluation, There's two of those factors of jhana. Directed thought is when you focus your attention on an object, and evaluation is when you evaluate it. See whether you like it, don't like it, what comments you have to make on it. 
And then there's just the basic feeling and perception that forms mental fabrication. These are all parts of that intention. Even when you go from the first jhana to the second, there's still feeling and, fab and perception. In fact, it's the perception that keeps you there. You have the perception of breath. Try to hold on to that perception until the breath energy in the body grows still. Then you stay with still breath as your perception. And then after all, that the border between your body and what's outside of your body begins to dissolve. Because you begin to realize that border was partly a perception, it was partly reinforced by the movement of the breath. But when the breath gets still, there's nothing there to reinforce it. And you begin to realize you can adjust your perception to space or consciousness. And there's no border to these things. In other words, after dealing with distractions, you start being able to focus on this one intention that you've got here and understand it. What's the process of fabrication going on in here? If it weren't still enough, if it weren't consistent enough, you wouldn't understand it. You'd get fleeting glimpses. And a lot of your insights are just that, little fleeting glimpses, and then you try to connect them. It's like playing connect the dots. And the problem is that connect the dots is it's the, the dots can be anything. It's like the constellations in the sky. We look up at Orion in the winter and we see his belt and we see his knife hanging from his belt. People in Thailand look up at it and they see a plow. The belt is the, the actual plow, and then the knife is the part that pulls the plow. And it's the same with most of our insights. If our awareness isn't continuous enough, all we see are the lines. We don't see the actual dots. But when you can stick with the intention, you begin to see where the lines really are. What connects to what? What causes what? And what actually makes up this intention that we've been working so hard to maintain? The other insight that comes is as you're maintaining an intention, it's like maintaining, say, a yoga posture. They talk about relaxing into the posture, and it's the same way, relaxing into the concentration. After all, you begin to realize that certain activities in that intention are not necessary. After the mind begins to settle down, you have less and less need for directed thought and evaluation. The breath gets more comfortable. You get more settled in, and there comes a point where you can drop the directed thought and evaluation, just be there one with the object, one with the breath. same way that when you're in a yoga posture, you begin to realize that there are certain muscles that you've been tensing that are really not necessary to tense. In fact, you'd be more comfortable in the posture if you relaxed it, those muscles. And those insights into which parts are going to have to be relaxed, you can't will those beforehand. You can pose the question in your mind, and that's what insight practice is. When the Buddha talks about how you develop insight, it's how you pose certain questions in your mind. How should fabrications be regarded? How should they be investigated? You can't put the mind through a mill. And guarantee that it's going to come out with insight. But if you learn to pose that question, and this is basically these are basically the questions that come from the Four Noble Truths. Where is the stress? What are you doing that's causing the stress? It starts with simple things like this. What is in the breath, what is tense in the body, what is 
blocked in the body that's really unnecessary. And you learn to relax it. Then in this state of concentration you have, okay, where is there still unnecessary stress and tension that makes it hard to maintain the concentration once you've settled in? We could learn how to relax those mental activities. Okay, that's the pattern, and you follow that pattern all the way through, as it takes you from one level of concentration to another. And to find you take it, take yourself as far as concentration can go. Again, try to maintain that as much as you can, because the more consistently you can maintain it, the more you're likely to catch sight of those unnecessary actions, because they are activities and they are inconstant. If they were totally constant, you'd never catch the fact that, of their existence. It's because they come and go that you realize, okay, now it's here, now it's not. There's something going on here. The stress comes, the stress goes. The cause comes, the cause goes. And it's a question of learning how to catch sight of it. And you pare down that intention of staying still until okay, there's nothing left to pare down without totally dropping intention. Again, that's unexpected. And you can't intend to see it at a particular spot, but you can pose the question, and it's posing the question that's it's called appropriate attention. That's, the, that's what opens things up, makes it possible to see things that you didn't intend to see, or to see them where you didn't intend to see them. And it's in this way that things finally open to the deathless. Again, the deathless isn't intended. It's something, when you hit it, you realize it was always there, and nothing you can do to, will change it. But you didn't notice it because you were more involved in your intentions and the results of your intentions. But you can't get there simply by saying, okay, I'm not going to intend anything anymore. That doesn't do it. You have to intend right concentration. That's the doing. That allows you to understand what it means to do well enough so you can actually stop doing. That's the intention that allows you to understand intention until you finally get to the point where you can stop intending. And it really is a stopping of intention. Not that hall of mirrors that says, well, I'm going to stop intending. Well, that's an intention to stop the intention, which is an intention to stop. And it just goes on and on and on like that. You can't reason yourself into this, but it's something that can be done, or you can bring yourself to the, the brink where it can happen. So work at this intention. Get to really know it. Get to be on good terms with it. Get as much of the mind on your side. As I said, they're making the breath comfortable, they're making the, the process interesting. And then learn to be resolute at cutting away things that aren't really helping. Things that pull you off in other directions. This is going to require all your ingenuity, all your attention. But it's one of the few skills in, in life that really is worth it, that really does more than repay all the effort put into it. And it'll see you all the way through every possible type of suffering. Because its rewards are, are more than you can intend. You can think about it, you can have a picture of what it's like. 
But again, the picture of the preconceived notion, that's an intention. It's part of the path. It helps you along, but the actual rewards when they come are much greater. So keep reminding yourself of the Buddha's instructions on tranquility and insight. For the tranquility, it's a question of how to settle in, how to really steady the mind in its intention, indulge in it, which means to learn how to enjoy it. And then learn how to question it. Not in the sense of doubting it, but learn how to question what's going on here. And when you learn how to bring those two activities together in the right balance, then you really learn what the Buddha was talking about.